so there is a development today which I can't really pass on without commenting a bit about because it's really involved my country in a very profound way. That is the war in Afghanistan. Um, before I talk a little bit about the British withdrawal, which is the, the theme that is is at the core here, what I um, want to point out is that when we talk about war in Afghanistan, it's very important to recognise that actually people tend to think um, that this is a war that began in 2001. This specific stage began in 2001, but actually Afghanistan has seen precious little peace since 1978. Uh, that year was the Tsar Revolution, then the Soviet invasion from 79 to 89, which was very bloody. Um, it was in many ways uh, Soviet Vietnam. Something RT would do well to remember incidentally when they attack the West for a situation in Afghanistan. They would do well to remember. They certainly, in my opinion, they should deal with a lot of the culpability of Afghan, the Afghan situation. Then um, in the early 90s there was a period of sort of anarchy. Then uh, the late 90s when the Taliban was in power from 96 to 2001 there was civil war. So Afghanistan and then of course 2001 onwards American led intervention. So Afghanistan is a country that's seen precious little peace in over 30 years. The only other countries I can think of that sort of compare to that in terms of perpetual conflict is Sudan, both Sudans and uh, Iraq. They're the only countries I can think of that have had such a long, possibly Yemen, such a long perpetual state of warfare. So in many ways Afghanistan is a very tragic country. The powerful film The Kite Runner sort of shows a window into what Taliban era Afghanistan was like between 96 and 2001. And it's very, very important that we don't lose sight of the fact um, of how totalitarian that was. Uh, women were treated as subhuman, as slaves, as the, the, you know, it's well documented how brutal they were to women. But um, they weren't exactly very wonderful towards men either. If a man's beard wasn't long enough, he would have been executed. Um, all music and dancing was banned. It was truly barbaric. So. When I talk about war situations, intervention situations, I always try to be objective and try to see both sides insofar as sometimes I have very little patience with the likes of the Stop the War Coalition because they're very good at criticising Western governments but they don't seem to have any objective critique of the other side, which is the Taliban. Um... I think it's fair to say the British public are very war weary and that's entirely understandable. My own personal stance on this is that I believe intervention was necessary. I think it's very, very naive to think that after the 9-11 attacks, and that is significant because Afghanistan was a training base for Al-Qaeda, after the 9-11 attacks the idea that the United States should have done nothing, just stayed back and done nothing, would have been unthinkable. People seem to think it's the case that um, President Bush should have just um, done nothing, but that's just ridiculous. Now, I know there's conspiracy theories about American ties to, um, to the Taliban and so on. Those are legitimate questions that need to be raised. But none of that, nevertheless, takes away from the fact that the Taliban was a vile, vile regime. Um, so was intervention justified? Well... One thing I would point out is, um, unlike Iraq, there was a lot more international support for intervention in Afghanistan. It was certainly a lot more universal than support for intervention in Iraq. So when people make these lazy lists like, oh, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and they act like it's all one and the same. Um, for one thing, Afghanistan isn't the Middle East, it's South Asia, so it's a different region for one thing. Um, there isn't a large abundance of oil there, so that isn't really an issue. Um, that having been said, I'm not uncritical of the way things have gone. I think it's 13 years is way too long, and our sacrifice has been massive. I mean, after the Americans, we've had the largest sacrifice, and we actually have experience of war in Afghanistan. We had several conflicts in the Victorian period, so maybe we should have learned from that. 
453 British service personnel killed. Um, whilst that's not comparable to the sort of figures seen in the First World War, when that sort of number would have been killed in one day, it's still a very heavy price to play, and for each individual family that is a massive sacrifice. Um, I, I don't agree that their sacrifice is in vain. And to talk about this, I, I want to just... The Times is a very good sort of, um, I think, balanced report on this. They have uh, a little article here, the balance sheet after 13 years of turmoil. Um, failures, and these are things that need to be taken seriously. The Taliban insurgency made gains in 2014, taking outlying areas in several provinces of the north, east and south. Afghan forces are strong in the urban centres, but have taken heavy casualties, with 4,380 soldiers and police killed in the year to mid-October. Presumably that means this year alone. So it's been a bloody year for Afghan forces, and their their service personnel are being killed at a rate of 11 a day. Another problem is the number of so-called green on blue attacks. That is, the Afghan forces supposedly are allies. The sheer number of attacks whereby they have um, killed NATO troops is is alarming. Afghanistan is the most corrupt country in the world, uh, according to the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. It ties for last place with Somalia and North Korea. Afghans report low confidence in the impartiality of government institutions such as the judiciary and police. Cultivation of opium has increased threefold since 2001. Afghanistan produces 80% of the world's illegal opium, which is refined into heroin. It fuels corruption, criminality in the Taliban. Um, the Defence Secretary, the new British Defence Secretary, Michael Fallon has admitted that Helmand province is going to be unstable for a very long time. Um, Afghanistan is one of the poorest nations in the world, so that hasn't changed at all since 2001. And the international community funds 60% of its annual budget. Gross national income has increased from $210 per capita in 2000 to $700, but 35% of the people live in extreme poverty. Afghanistan is ranked 147th out of 148 nations by the UN for quality of the sexes. Women make up only 15% of the workforce. So clearly Afghanistan is a country that still has very grave problems and in no way should these things be swept under the carpet. In that sense, it's difficult for... When I hear senior commanders talk about this being a wonderful achievement, I think they're being way too complacent. Having said that, I do think that in media and in debate about campaigns in Afghanistan far too often only the negative is spoken about and I think that is unfair um, it's unfair on the soldiers especially who have sacrificed there so it hasn't been a complete and utter failure there has been some successes life expectancy has risen from 50 in 2000 to over 60 that's an increase of 10 years in 2003, there were 450 health facilities in Afghanistan. Now there's only over 2,000, so that has to be welcomed. In 2000, 1 million boys attended school and no girls. In 2012, the total figure was 7.8 million. That's a very significant increase. Girls made up 36%. So girls are still in the minority, but the very fact that girls are going to school at all has to be welcomed when you consider that they were completely banned under the Taliban. Afghanistan has completed two parliamentary cycles since 2000 and a transfer of power to a new president. There were claims of election fraud, but on the whole, democracy was a success. Now, the Karzai administration, I think, has been pretty corrupt and it is only marginally better than the Taliban in terms of human rights violations, but in a country as absolutely backward as Afghanistan, all of these successes need to be noted. The nation is a flourishing independent media and some of the strongest laws in the region for freedom of speech. It has 68 private TV channels and 174 radio stations. However, the media watchdog Freedom House says journalists routinely face violent threats and intimidation by security forces and officials. Afghanistan has mineral deposits of copper, iron ore, lanthanum, cerium, neodymium, I don't know what that is, aluminium, gold, silver, zinc, mercury and lithium, all of which is valued by the US Department of Defense at 908 billion. Clearly Afghanistan has potential to be a happier country um, and clearly there has been some successes. So I do think that 
when we debate Afghanistan, it was very important that people are objective <coughs> and look at the successes as well as the failures. That's why I have very little patience with the likes of the Stop the War Coalition when they say it's all been a massive um, failure. And I think the wider public seem to take that view. So it's unfortunate that only one side is really being seen. I think the media has a responsibility to show both sides. Um, at the same time, we shouldn't be in denial that there remain very grave problems. So my, my uh, outlook on this is no way has it been a big success. Um, the Taliban still are in control in several areas. But I don't agree that those soldiers have died in vain because there has been successes. Um, war and peace are never simple issues in my opinion. And let's never lose sight of the fact that the Taliban was one of the most monstrous regimes of modern times. Can anyone really dispute that? So I think it's one thing sort of condemning um, Western governments saying, oh, look at what you've done, you, you invaded this country, you, um, although I believe that intervention is the correct term, but if you're going to go down that line, at least also acknowledge the successes and at least the only fair way to do this is to compare Afghanistan to 2001. Some things have improved, some things have got worse. So really it's a mixed picture. It's not a complete success at all, but nor is it a complete failure, and I believe that all those who say that it is are actually insulting the sacrifice of the troops who have died there. Um, and I just think that people need to be objective on this. For me, the war went on way too long, and certainly 453 lives lost is a very heavy price to pay, and we should never, ever overlook the sacrifice of those service personnel who died and it has been a bloody conflict um, figures are not consistent but by some accounts as many as 25,000 Afghan civilians um, thousands of Afghan security forces Taliban losses no one knows for sure because there's so many dis, uh, sort of uh, inconsistent figures on that but it's been a bloody conflict but no more so than the Soviet war in fact, I would say it's been less um, less violent than that, and that in no way is a trivialization. But when I see Russia today try to lecture the West on Afghanistan, I think, well, it was Soviet troops that urinated in mosques in Afghanistan. It was the Soviet Union that caused a lot of this problem in the first place. Um, in fact, it was the Soviet Union that helped the Taliban get the power, because they bred the resentment in Afghanistan that led to that... Um, extreme conservative reaction. Um, the tragedy is, 50 years ago, Afghanistan was relatively secular and um, certainly not comparable to today. So, in many ways, it is still a very bleak place, but I just think that people need to be objective on this. If you're going to come onto this video, for now I'll leave comments open, but if you're going to abuse me as a neocon or something like that, I'm going to delete the comment because I'm not going to put up with that crap. I've tried to make this an objective video. I accept it's a very controversial subject. I'm trying to be objective. I've read out both sides. And I personally feel that there has been mixed successes. But I just... What I would say is people need to be open-minded about this. Um, what... I mean, what would be the moral alternative of just turning a blind eye and allowing the Taliban to stand par? Given their track record. So I do believe that intervention was morally justified in 2001, but there were some fatal mistakes made. Jack Straw admitted that um, the war against opium production was a big problem because, for one thing, many Afghans rely on it as a livelihood. So there were fundamental mistakes made, but I think the principles were the right ones. Um, so I do believe this is an example of a just war. And that is not to say it's a good thing. War is never, ever a good thing. But... It's just my view on the matter. Um, I'll leave the comment section open, but like I say, if you're going to comment, please do it in a civil manner. That's all I ask. If anyone comes on my video to insult me, call me a warmonger or a neocon or something like that, number one, I'm not. Um, I have tried to be objective in this, but all I ask is people try and be objective in the response. Thank you.